Hi everybody, my name is Valeria Ferrari and I'm the general manager of Titan Company. As someone knows, I'm a biomedical engineer and I work in an engineering company. For that reason, we are devoted in changing the world we are living in with continuous education. Our primary aim when we organize webinars like today is not selling, selling stuff. Our aim is creating a background, creating culture for giving you weapons for fighting your daily struggles. And uh, today I have the, pl the pleasure to introduce you a master in functional analysis, that is Dr. Johannes uh, Schmitz. And uh, from 99 to 2011, I was visiting professor in University of Milan, teaching uh, masticatory biomechanics, morphology and function of a uh, TM joint. Uh, he's an active member of uh, IOP, the Italian Academy of uh, Prosthetic Dentistry, and uh, he published uh, several on um, several uh, international peer review journals. He's a speaker in national and international congresses, and he's also he also has a, a private pra a practice. So the best combination of a private practice and keeping an eye on research and congresses. So I hope you enjoyed, and if you have any questions, just write in the chat. I will read at the end of the presentation for not interrupting Dr. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, and I hope you enjoyed. So please, thank you again for being here. Thank you, Valeria. So um, let's start uh, directly uh, speaking of uh, surface electromyography. And um, as uh, Carlo De Luca, who is a very big expert in, in uh, functional uh, biomechanics and, and has applied electromyography, has described electromyography as a seductive muse. Why? Because it's, it's uh, easy, it gives access to uh, tons of information, but at the same time, it has to be clearly understood uh, because um, maybe sometimes it can also be misleading in some, in some ways because it is so, such an easy, such an easy uh, exam to, to, to use. So we will speak about signal recording, calibration, signal analysis, and then uh, clinical evaluation. Regarding uh, the signal recording, uh, well, we can make a first distinction, which is um, we can have surface electromyography and we can have needle electromyography. Now, uh, there are uh, very many differences between these two, and the Uh, of course, if you speaking of, uh, if you speak of uh, needle electromyography, uh, it needs a, a small wound uh, because you need a, a you will use a needle. It gives a very very precise information, uh, but it is also limited because it only uh, will select a few fibers. Whereas if you're using surface electromyography, you have a more of a general uh, idea of uh, the functioning of the uh, functional apparatus. And uh, speaking of surface electromyography, you can have uh, single electrodes or you can have uh, uh, multiple electrodes. And this also will make a difference. If, you re if you're reading with uh, uh, bipolar uh, electrodes on the surface of the skin, Uh, you, what you're reading is uh, the sum of uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, motor units, and this gives way to uh, a myoelectric signal on, on the surface of the skin, and this is what uh, you are reading. Of course, you can also have an array of, of electrodes, which we won't uh, uh, go into much uh, into detail. And If you, to give an example, if you are um, looking at a, a landscape, if you are uh, dealing with uh, a needle electromyography, then you're looking at a single uh, small uh, window 
And if you're in, instead uh, looking at a surface electromyography, it's like looking at a wider picture. So you're, you have a sum of uh, motor units and you have a cr a some uh, crosstalk between uh, various muscles, but you get a general idea of how the system is functioning. There are a number of factors that can influence the surface uh, electromyographic signal, which are anatomical, such as, for example, the fatty tissue thickness uh, or the moistness of the skin or uh, the muscle form and uh, the, the mass of the, uh, uh, of the muscles themselves. Then there are technical, more technical uh, details that can uh, alter the signal, which are the shape and, and uh, position of the, of the electrodes, uh, which, uh, uh, as in the example before, could be considered a bit like a, a, a lens of, the, of a camera and uh, can be shifted uh, and look, will look at the landscape in a different way. And there are uh, physiological uh, uh, issues such as age or muscle trophism, for example, and of course uh, some clinical issues such as missing teeth, teeth or uh, reduced periodontal support. Uh, the, re the receptors uh, of, of um, all of the sum of the receptors uh, will give some feedback to uh, the cortical. Uh, uh, the, the, the cortical fibers, let's say, and uh, the cortical areas, and this uh, this uh, feedback can uh, also alter the the signal in, in itself. Uh, as an example, um, this is a, a report that we did a pretty long time ago more than 20 years ago, and where we can see that there is an interference uh, on one side and um, to, to the right, and where the uh, interference was present, uh, there was an inhibition of the signal. Whereas when there was no interference, um, which means a gospel coverage, and uh, then uh, the signal was not uh, in inhibited. So, uh, of course, um, this goes through this uh, type of circuit, and uh, it just uh, it goes to show that there is some interaction between the occlusal uh, aspect and the electromyography uh, that uh, is recorded. But we're speaking of um, a pretty large uh, thickness, uh, 250 microns, and of course, Clinically, we're dealing with a lot uh, thinner um, thicknesses. Uh, if you uh, will forgive my uh, my play of words, so we go from from 200 uh, microns, but we are usually dealing with 80 or 40 or even 12 microns, and. All these, uh, all these uh, articulating papers will give uh, different uh, information to the clinicians. So we really don't need any uh, further information to deal with uh, occlusal aspects. Um, but electromyography is still useful and we'll see uh, later on why. So, the first thing we have to keep in mind is that there are a lot of variables involved, uh, as we have seen before. So what we need is a calibration, and this calibration can usually be done with uh, cotton rolls, and we will normalize all the um, all the signals uh, relative to this uh, calibration. And this is an example where on the left we have uh, the signal. These are uh, the, the, uh, all the muscle fibers uh, that are active. Um, in the center is on uh, what's happening on the, uh, uh, without the cotton rolls. And then this is on the right, you will see 
what uh, the changes are proportional in proportion uh, relative to uh, what's happening on the cotton rolls. And um, if you repeat uh, the same exam after uh, 15 days, you see that the numbers all change, but uh, the, uh, the end, uh, uh, let's say the end uh, picture uh, is uh, quite similar. So the end result is similar. So this is the uh, meaning of the calibration, okay? So we're, we're beginning with a raw signal and we can uh, analyze uh, this raw signal um, uh, in, let's say, uh, uh, in some ways, but the best, um, the best option is to um, uh, uh, evaluate the root mean square, which means we take the signal that is uh, going towards the positive and to the negative, uh, it, because it's in uh, microvolts. And we uh, elevate it to a square, so they're all positive values, and then we take the square root of that signal. So uh, we, we can have a value, and uh, what is shown here is uh, the activity of uh, four muscles and, uh, during five seconds. And these uh, these uh, muscles we can ha we can work out some we can evaluate some indices for example and we can have a, a mean value uh, and we can have uh, an asymmetry for example we can calculate an asymmetry or we can have uh, a predominance of uh, the, the group number one or group number two in this case it would be temporalis anterior and masseter. Uh, of course, uh, if we evaluate things uh, through the root mean square, uh, we have a, a mean value that is um, during the whole, uh, the whole acquisition period. But if we think of it, we can have uh, two, um, also we can have a, a difference in, in timing, for example. If, if we have uh, a muscle, uh, we have in red the right and in left the uh, left uh, muscles here of the same group. And let's say in the first half of uh, the time period where we're analyzing the activity of the muscle, the right uh, side is predominant. And then uh, the left side could uh, be predominant in, in the second half of the exam. And of course, this would change things because uh, we would have a, a predominance to the right first and then to the left. So if we want to introduce time, we have to uh, think differently, not using the root mean square, but we can uh, use the integral, uh, uh, the areas of, of the under, underlying uh, the, the signal. And then we can uh, see what happens during, uh, during the uh, evaluation period. So this uh, is called the percentage overlapping coefficient. And basically, uh, the meaning is that we consider time as well as the, the mean value. So regarding the clinical evaluation, I would like to start first uh, by defining occlusion. So occlusion can be uh, simply considered uh, the act of closing the articulating, masticating surfaces of the upper and lower arches. And of course, this is one way to look at it. Uh, some authors have considered a wider meaning to uh, this, uh, uh, this aspect. So in this sense, uh, the definition of uh, occlusion is uh, not limited to uh, uh, morphological tooth contact. 
uh, and not limited to tooth contact, but rather it involves uh, various uh, parts of the uh, masticatory system and also the neuromuscular system, the temporomandibular joints, and it has a wider, uh, it gives a wider perspective to um, uh, the, the, the simple uh, closing of the teeth. And, but this also can be a little bit confusing because then the meaning of occlusion can involve most anything. So um, we can consider occlusion as a, a physiologic occlusion, and which means it can deviate from uh, the norm, uh, but is still acceptable. It still has no dysfunction, let's say. And uh, there are no, there's no pathology. So, all in all, the somatic, the system is able to resist to the stimuli. Uh, the stimuli it is, uh, it is uh, given, and the supporting tissues find uh, a, a good balance. And so, uh, there's a, a homeostasis. And of course, there's a uh, uh, range of adaptation, at the end of which we have a non-physiologic occlusion where we have pathologic effects, which means a, a trauma from occlusion. And uh, in general, the system is not able to resist the stimuli uh, it, is, it is given, and the supporting tissues are also um, not able to resist to uh, these uh, stimuli. And so we have reached the, uh, the end of the, the, the capacity of the system to adapt. And we can have a physiologic uh, occlusion uh, with uh, some treatment needs, such as, as uh, in this case. And um, we can treat this uh, occlusion with introducing a therapeutic occlusion, which means it's a stereotypical occlusion where we make things work the way it, they, they, they should or as close as possible to that. And uh, these stereotypical schemes can be used to treat uh, patients. And this is like wearing a belt and also uh, uh, the, the uh, well, I can't think of the word in this moment. And uh, so, if we follow these these stereotypical rules, uh, of course, these um, the re end result is that we gain a stable situation through time. And if we do things properly, this is up to 2018, but the patient is still going going on well. And basically, nothing much has happened in these past uh, uh, 12 years or so. And um, so this is uh, something to, to always remember. So what is the relationship between occlusion and parafunction then? Because uh, how do we deal with this? Well, there's no short answer, and uh, there's uh, the temporomandibular disorders uh, do, are not very well linked to um, uh, the occlusion in itself. So there are no relevant features that can lead to, or more frequently lead to, signs and symptoms of uh, temporomandibular disorders. And about uh, 20 years or so, um, this was also uh, uh, underlined by the Berber and and, uh, uh, and, al. and um, they were still a little bit cautious with uh, proposing, for example, prosthetic changes in the occlusion to treat uh, temporomandibular disorders, but we're still a little bit uh, open to um, uh, considering prosthetic uh, uh, treatment. So um, in time, 
things have uh, re evolved and uh, more uh, lately. And uh, this uh, very nice uh, systematic review uh, by Daniele Manfredini and, and Carlo Poggio, um, they uh, really answered a few questions. And the questions are, should uh, prostodontics be used to treat uh, TND or bruxism? And of course, the answer is no, because uh, uh, the temporal mandibular disorders are not, uh, or don't deal with occlusion in, as, uh, in itself, but, um, and so there's no real, um, something that can be done in, in the peripheral uh, areas. Uh, because uh, bruxism and temporal mandibular joints and TND are, are uh, based on uh, basically on something that happens uh, centrally, not in, in uh, the periphery. But at the same time, can prosthodontics cause TND or bruxism? And this is also not such a clear association. So it is really unlikely that uh, such uh, a phenomenon can be induced. And so how can we then treat patients if there are TND uh, present? There's no, uh, no uh, evidence-based recommendations that are available. And uh, again, we have a tendency to use uh, the habitual position of the interarch relationships and to use uh, uh, stereo more stereotypical uh, um, occlusion uh, to optimize function. So the, the correction of dental occlusion should not be a guiding principle or indication for prosthetic treatment. And I would say for any kind of uh, occlusal or treatment that involves uh, big changes, irre irreversible changes in, uh, um, in the occlusion. So uh, what about electromyography then? Well, electromyography, has a limited use uh, with, uh, it, within the realm of uh, TNDs. And uh, uh, this is especially true for the uh, type of electromyography that's uh, uh, based on uh, uh, the resting values. Well, meaning that the uh, muscles can be, uh, can be uh, evaluated during function or at rest and of course if we were using uh, the rest values then this is the more true um, however uh, surface electromyography has a limited use well this is shouldn't be such a big surprise because when we deal with uh, temporal mandibular disorders actually um, the diagnosis is more clinical than uh, than otherwise, and also when we deal with with these patients, of course we have to we have to deal with the clinical aspect more than uh, than uh, how the muscles behave. So we are getting we are reaching a point where we uh, are, are can deal with. Um, the, the clinical evaluation of uh, surface electromyography. First of all, is this uh, always possible? And the answer is clearly no, it is not always possible. And this is because if we are deviating a lot from the norm, then it really doesn't make much sense to uh, do such an exam um, because the, the reference will be distorted. What kind of, uh, of exams can we, can we do uh, with, can we evaluate with surface electromyography? Well, we, have, we can have rest position with or without uh, uh, exams that uh, uh, have to do with, uh, let's say, the washout um, of, of muscles. So we can st stimulate the muscles and then we can uh, uh, have a very relaxed state, and we can use this as a, a reference position 
could be. Uh, I don't have much experience myself doing this, and uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, um, the values that are uh, achievable with uh, during rest position are so low that they are uh, below the threshold of, of the reliability of uh, of an electromyogram. Uh, of an electromyogram. So uh, it, it it has to be done with great caution. It can be done during function, for example, during mastication. Uh, Sub-maximal voluntary clenching is also another possibility. And uh, with some kind of uh, biofeedback uh, telling the person uh, he or she is clenching at 50% of the maximum or, or another percentage. And this is sometimes difficult to obtain or maximum voluntary clenching. This is also uh, a, a very uh, easily uh, definable position, a very easily, easily definable uh, situation. So this is, uh, in my opinion, the best way to, to do it. Along with uh, mastication, with uh, chewing also gives very, very interesting and important uh, information. So when we're dealing with maximum voluntary clenching, um, it has already, uh, values have already been uh, validated in literature. These are two reports by uh, Ferrari and co-workers. Uh, I have also been part of this uh, group and um, along with uh, a lot of uh, other very good colleagues and good friends of mine. And um, well, we have already some values that uh, we can uh, use as reference. And these uh, papers were uh, written selecting uh, uh, normal, very normal uh, young uh, adults with uh, no uh, pathology whatsoever. And uh, so it was pretty clear that this was the normal state or the, 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 the the values of, of the norm that we can uh, use as reference. But we also have to keep in mind that um, many times, even when we have uh, distortions from, from a, a normal situation, and we have three uh, extreme examples, and um, we have um, in each case, we have a good neuromuscular balance. And um, so we have normal values in each one of these cases. And of course, um, it, is, it might not always be the case, but um, we have to be aware of the fact that um, a not normal Normal vision does not necessarily um, bring to a not normal neuromuscular situation, and uh, the opposite is also true. So, uh, not normal neuromuscular situation does not always correspond to uh, um, uh, uh, wrong. I, I, I want to say malocclusion, but then this term needs to be defined differently from what we are used to as we have seen before, and let's say non-physiological -physio occlusion is perhaps a better term. And also, if we have a reduced number of contacts, this is a very old case, and I'm sorry about uh, uh, the images which have were taken from Diaz, and then uh, I had to scan the Diaz, and um, also in this case, we see that uh, the values are mm, normal. We have a uh, percentage of elapsing coefficient uh, well above 85%. And um, uh, the, the values are, th this would be considered a normal, uh, a normal exam. Of course, once again, we don't need electromyography to tell us this is a norm not normal situation. 
And of course, we have uh, a lot of problems uh, in, in this case as well. But again, uh, we on, the only thing we can notice is that we have very low values, which would not be normal, but otherwise it's quite symmetric and uh, uh, in many uh, aspects, it would be considered a normal exam as well. In this case, we see something completely different. So um, we can introduce a, a concept here, which is that we, when we have a cuspal inclines uh, uh, touching each other, we can have an unstable uh, interact relationship. And this can uh, indeed um, bring to not normal uh, results. In this case, the um, indices uh, are quite low. So this would not be a, a, a normal exam. And uh, once again, uh, this patient has obviously some problems. Uh, occlusal problems are not uh, necessarily uh, something to be treated, but uh, the patient wanted to uh, improve the smile and also uh, wanted to improve uh, the chewing capacity of, of, his, uh, of his mouth. And uh, in this case as well, we see unstable relationship and uh, once again, we see uh, both um, uh, low values, uh, the muscles are not able to contract very readily, and also we see uh, some uh, very flat surfaces and unstable relationship, and this also gives, um, uh, gives way to uh, not normal uh, result of the exam. So, in general, we have two uh, conditions. Uh, one is inhibition of the muscle fibers, which is given mostly by pain. For example, if we have a periodontal situation, uh, uh, periodontal pathology, caries, or whatever situation is there, occlusal trauma, for example. Or, um, Another uh, very important topic is unstable occlusion. So unstable occlusion can be um, there because the prosthetic uh, situation is not adequate, for example. In this sense, it would be mostly hydrogenic. Or uh, it can be uh, after grinding because uh, to eliminate interferences. So we have to be very uh, aware that that can uh, in itself bring to uh, altered, uh, an altered neuromuscular balance. And it can also be a primary condition of, uh, of the muscles where they are not functioning properly, but this is relative to a more general um, uh, medical condition. So uh, we can have a natural occlusion and uh, in a natural occlusion, we can have a, a quite a high level of, of adaptation. And um, of course, teeth can migrate, they can rotate, they can adapt very easily. And uh, the coordination of, of, uh, between the muscle and the neuromuscular system develops over a long period of time. But then uh, if you have uh, unstable, an unstable situation or if you have cuspal inclines uh, touching each other, then uh, the neuromuscular balance can also disappear. Uh, and so it would uh, bring us at the very edge of uh, the possibility to adapt and bring us to uh, the non-physiologic occlusion, such as in this case. So we can correct uh, this situation and we have prosthodontic occlusion. And in this case, the level of adaptation is uh, in itself low. Why? Because 
um, we have to be careful with uh, the uh, treatment planning. We have to be aware of, uh, of the many aspects that uh, are involved. And we don't have much margin to accommodate um, if uh, there is an imprecise adaptation between the two arches. So we have to be quite uh, aware of this, of this uh, aspect. And also, it would be nice to have more information. So in this case, we have uh, uh, not a badly uh, uh, off-balance uh, situation at the beginning of treatment, um, but still not normal results, as we can see here. Uh, the POC uh, indices uh, on the temporalis is, is still high, but uh, in the mass editor it's, it's uh, below 80% at the beginning. So also the activity uh, indices are, are not, are not uh, normal. Uh, where um, at the end of treatment we can uh, we have normalized um, the values of uh, the, the POC uh, indices, and um, so we are quite confident that um, the new situation is acceptable by the neuromuscular system. Of course, uh, this is only. Um, one uh, more point that we have to consider. It's not um, the only exam. Of course, we, we will use the articulating paper. Of course, we will use all the clinical uh, exams and um, techniques that we usually use, but this, is, this can give us some more, uh, some more information. And uh, this is, uh, the way um, uh, these uh, values would be uh, seen uh, using the TFM report. So I have also uh, recently introduced uh, this uh, electromyograph in, in uh, the specific uh, TFM electromyograph in my, in my practice. And so we have uh, this uh, situation where we have severe periodontitis and the patient needs to be treated. This is at the end of treatment, quite a complex uh, treatment. And uh, of course, at the beginning, it didn't make much sense to test the neuromuscular balance of this patient. But at the end, we see that uh, this is just the day of, of the delivery all the values are looking quite good, and so I'm quite pleased about that. Um, but uh, we have to still keep in mind that uh, this is not the only uh, the only uh, point that we have to look at. Uh, another case: this uh, young uh, lady has as an open on her left uh, left side and uh, she wants to she had been has been trying to improve her her chewing ability and um, but uh, the teeth are not moving they're ankylosed and so they, she has to be treated and we have to keep in mind if we look at uh, only the POC uh, indices we see that they are quite normal and so this is not the problem. She's a young woman and her muscles are well adapted to the situation, even though there is uh, something wrong with her chewing. And we don't need any other exam. We can just ask her if, if uh, she's okay with her uh, uh, chewing ability. And she, uh, so we can have uh, a step forward and we can uh, look at the mastication, at the chewing. And we can see that on the right side, she's only chewing uh, or mostly chewing with her temporalis. And she, this quite exactly corresponds to uh, what she was describing. She said, on the right side, I'm only chewing with my front teeth. So 
the front teeth correspond to the temporalis activity and the back teeth to the masseter. And so we, we see there's a big asymmetry between the left and uh, the right side. So in this sense, the chewing exam is quite important and it adds uh, quite an amount of information to uh, the simple static uh, evaluation. So why should we use the uh, surface uh, electromyography? Well, we can determine the neuromuscular effect of occlusion on the masticatory system. And uh, of course, we can objectively record a certain situation. And for example, if we are uh, introducing a, a bite plane, uh, then we can check the bite plane using just normal articulating paper, but then we want to also know what the neuromuscular balance is on, on, on the bite plane, and this will give us more information. So, for example, if we start from a, a well-balanced situation, we want to keep this balance also uh, on, on the bite plane or whatever change we, we have planned uh, clinically. What I strongly believe is that we shouldn't use um, electromyography to justify changes in occlusion because um, the, the uh, changes are determined uh, clinically and not instrumentally. And this is something that we have to uh, acknowledge in, in, in a way. And so this is uh, the end of uh, the presentation and uh, I hope there are some questions that uh, I can answer. Um, and so thank you. These are my references. Uh, if you have uh, some further questions that you would like to ask. So I, I should uh, leave the, um, let's say the spot to Valeria. Thank you again, Dr. Schmitz. And uh, they just ask him, they just ask us, um, when do you suggest to do the chewing protocol in your daily practice? Uh, uh, for which patient uh, are you uh, choosing the, also the, chew, the chewing protocol? Well, as I said before, uh, the, the chewing protocol gives adds item an amount of information. The only big problem I see at the moment is that some work is needed. So we, we still need more uh, reference normative values. And but I use it uh, on uh, I've used it on every patient uh, since I got the, the electromyograph in my office. And I, I strongly believe it, it does add a, a quite an amount of information. For example, uh, if um, you are delivering uh, complex processes as uh, rehabilitation, as, as we have seen before, the, the chewing uh, can, at the beginning, be uh, a bit cumbersome. So there's nothing wrong with the, with your rehabilitation, but uh, it just gives sh um, uh, shows that uh, the patient needs to learn in a way how to chew on that specific uh, situation. But in any case, I, I would use it on every patient. Okay. Um, they ask you if you use also Titan in your during your first visits uh, of your patient. Or do you yes. just in comparison before and after treatment? Uh, that depends on on, uh, on the patient. I, I I'm not well. I don't use it on every patient that comes into my office. Uh, in the sense that some patients uh, don't need uh, any kind of occlusal change, for example. So in that case. Mm, yes, why not? Uh, it, it's it's uh, very quick, so uh, I don't see any contraindication. I'm not using it for every single patient at the moment, but uh, I plan to to do so. Let's say. 
Okay. Okay, this is a really interesting question. About unstable byte, as you say before, um, you said that uh, when you have an unstable byte, uh, you have basically unstable results. And uh, there is a doctor who's saying that uh, probably you can have also information about the unstable byte, the periodontist uh, disease or uh, uh, unstable conditions. So, uh, he thinks that is also useful for uh, analyzing that kind of patient. Uh, so, do you agree or do you think that it's better not taking consideration this kind of, of, the, of the results when you're planning your treatment? Okay, so uh, if, if, if let's say I have a first visit, the patient comes with pain, okay? So, I, I don't need to, to do any kind of exam to know that uh, in that case, the exam will be altered. Um, so the best bet would be to eliminate pain or the unstable, what's causing instability, and then uh, move on. But in other cases, uh, the unstable condition is, uh, let's say, permanent. So it, it, there's no periodontal condition. Um, so in, in that case, it could give information. But then you, I mean, uh, you can uh, you can analyze that situation if you're if you're curious. But it, I don't see how it it, uh, it will add any more information really. In my opinion, that's still it, it's it's not going to hurt uh, anyone if you do it also, but it's not going to give add anything to your diagnosis. I mean, the diagnosis for periodont for a periodontal condition is is done otherwise. It's not neuromuscular. Okay, and uh, during the rehabilitation, you, are you considering also the impact as an important factor for evaluating the vertical dimension or no? Yes, um, although um, again, we are for, for certain uh, situations, we have uh, clear normative values, which so we need. We, we know what is normal and what isn't, but then um, uh, the clinical use is not so clear cut. Let me explain. For example, if you have uh, uh, an increasing vertical dimension and you have a decreasing impact, probably you have stretched the fibers a bit too much and you have inhibition. Whereas if you uh, still have an increase in impact. You can you have still some leeway to increase some more if you need if you need to. But it's um, uh, the increase in vertical dimension is is uh, is quite complex. I mean it it needs to uh, take many factors into consideration and. Uh, the impact is, is certainly one of them. Okay. Okay. Uh, so they ask you if you are using the values also for spleen calibration and how you use it. So the first question should be do you use Titan or EMG analysis also for spleen calibration? And the second is uh, if yes. Uh, how do you use the values for changing and for fine-tuning your, your spleens? Okay. Uh, this is, I don't want to be misunderstood, so I will try to uh, be, be as specific as possible. So, um, I strongly believe that um, the best, the gold standard for any kind of occlusal equilibration is by using articulating paper that is very thin. Uh, ideally, uh, up to eight or 16 microns, depending, or 12 microns in that area. 
And this is way below the thresholds uh, that can be detected uh, systematically by electromyography. So the way I, at the beginning, I used to be guided by electromyography. But then I realized that um, not necessarily uh, I was, oh, it was cumbersome because I had to adjust, but I didn't know how. And then I wasn't using the right articulating paper. So with time, I uh, started using uh, various uh, thicknesses of articulating paper. I use 200, I use 80 uh, with silk, and I use uh, uh, eight microns, okay? Or actually eight microns folded into, so that would mean 16 microns. And in, in that case, I am pretty sure that what my occlusal equilibration is clinically correct. Then I test the electromyography, and then I see if there's still something that is off. So I, uh, my protocol with uh, the splint uh, equilibration is I deliver the splint, I check it occlusally, clinically, and then I let the patient wear it for at least uh, one consecutive week every night, and then I go back and do electromyography and uh, uh, do the occlusal uh, equilibration once again uh, clinically, let's say, with, with the articulating paper. So I'm pretty sure that I got to a very detailed uh, equilibration. And also, normally, I, I achieve a very good um, electromyography electromyographically controlled neuromuscular balance on the splints because they really go hand in hand. I mean, it's uh, not, not often uh, that you see a very well equilibrated uh, uh, splint and a very off-balanced uh, neuromuscular situation. So that doesn't really happen in my clinical practice, at least. Yeah, you already answered to another question that was uh, after your follow-up of, of a splint, so after um, how many days are you checking with the EMG and uh, if you find after a while that something is changing or you are not reached uh, the best balance, if you change it or if you... Um, I change it. Uh, if I you leave it to adapt, okay. Okay, so okay. once again, my uh, electromyography, in my uh, opinion, uh, is, is a very, very uh, good and precise indicator whether the equilibration I have uh, clinically achieved is acceptable by the system or not. And if, if I see that the clinical equilibration works for me, but the uh, muscles then I, I leave it, I, I, I won't be guided by the electromyography, but I give another appointment after some time, let's say after another two weeks, and then I go on and check again electromyography, uh, electromyographically, and, and uh, check, and usually uh, after some time, one of the two happens, either my occlusal equilibration is off after two weeks, and so I have to check it again, and then uh, it will correspond to electromyography, or the electromyography, the, the clinical aspect is fine, and the uh, neuromuscular balance follows. One of the two usually happens. So I keep on checking. Okay. I, want to, I want to see a corresponding uh, uh, corresponding values. I mean, if it seems uh, well balanced to me, then uh, I want to also have a well balanced electromyography. If it isn't, then I keep on checking. Okay. Now, that's a very nice question from 
one of our latest user and it's about uh, if you show the result to your patient and you use the report as a tool for uh, as the mean for discussing uh, what you see or if you use it as your for your uh, private certainties let's call it like this okay fact, sure uh, this is a very besides being useful clinically electromyography is also a very good communication tool so if you see the patient at the very very beginning and it is the type of patient where you suspect that there is some neuromuscular unbalance or you will have to do some occlusal changes or you will you want to go in a certain direction then um, doing electromyography at first of course after having out, uh, eliminated what what could be altering the exam then um, you can communicate better with the patient and this is this it makes a lot of sense to me to communicate with the patient then once you have um, done the occlusal changes and you get the feedback from the patient oh by the way um, in my opinion the patient is almost always right so if they say uh, doctor you know i have a feeling um, i touch more here or there this i disregard anything else and i believe the patient so i check that first and then i i i approve of it approve of the changes also the tramography with the electromyography but I, yeah, otherwise that's... i would be using it uh, um, um, in, in reverse i would be using electromyography to convince the patient that uh, he or she is thinking nonsense which is not the case yeah that's the, the best the best uh, i mean saying that the, the patient is always right i think it's the best uh, way to proceed otherwise of course uh, yeah. there's a fair communication with with patients yeah. Um, um okay how do you uh, evaluate results obtained if you are if they are not agree um with what you are say, seeing the mouth of the patient so basically it's a typical condition where you find a, a emg uh, evaluation that is not immediately related to the occlusion status that you can evaluate okay. your, with your so how is your reaction and how you intervene in that case? Okay, sure, sure. Okay, so let's say a, a typical situation would be uh, a patient that uh, has uh, massive occlusal changes happening in her, his or her mouth. Let's say a splint or a big occlusal re rehabilitation, okay? And we're on temporaries, typically. So first, I asked the patient, how do you feel about uh, the way your uh, arches are touching each other with the splint in the middle or on the rehabilitation? Is it fine for you or not? And I get some feedback. And this is the most important feedback I get. Situation, and I really trust the way I I look uh, the way I the, the the things I see because when you're using very fine articulating paper, then um, there's really not much uh, that else that you can do. Of course, the system is adapting, which means you have you you can still have a muscle that is about to relax and is not yet there, but it it will if you stabilize a situation. So then, uh, if you wait two weeks, then it will do one of two things. Either the occlusion will be off or the EMG will be normalized. So my reaction is, hmm, I see some, uh, uh, the electromyography tells me something that is going opposite to the direction I, I suppose it should be going. So let's, we have to check again. And this is my reaction, I check again. Okay. Another question is: uh, In a holistic way, do you consider altered 
maladaptin stable TM joint confirmed by CBCT and MRI for the equilibration and spleen therapy and the use of EMG in those cases and um, body and cervical imbalance too. So basically, are you considering also in an holistic way uh, in, in patients with unstable TM joint or uh, that are confirmed by CBCT or MRI? If you are considering also splint, the splint effect combined with the EMG and analysis, and in general, if you're taking consideration also the cervical imbalance, imbalancement, so I, I suppose this would be some ascending disorder or descending disorder, that kind of uh, approach. Um, it's not really my cup of tea, to be honest. Um, I, I see, what I see is uh, a lot of people, a lot of patients that have problems with unstable joints, you really don't need uh, an instrumental exam to confirm what's happening inside of the joint. You already know what's going to happen, what, ha what is happening, uh, an internal joint derangement or uh, something of the sort. So MRI more than uh, CBCT or whatever, uh, yes, I ask for it. Um, the patients usually uh, also benefit from some form of physiotherapy, and I often send them to do some form of physiotherapy. And um, yes, that involves uh, the TMJ uh, joints and also the cervical spine, of course. And um, uh, all in all, the, these patients uh, invariably tell me that um, their neck hurts less, and so it's it's a it's a benefit that they get from the split therapy. But I don't. It doesn't modify my approach any, uh, to be honest. So yeah, I I, I consider just these factors, um, the joints, the muscles, and uh, of course the posture also. If I see there's an incorrect posture, then, uh, well, I don't consider myself as a splintologist or a posturologist or of any kind. I consider myself to be a dentist with some knowledge of the biomechanics of the system. And um, so, for me, the, the most important is if, if I see that there's a, a posture uh, that could be leading to some neck problems, for example, I try to understand where that comes from. Sometimes it would be um, um, uh, a change of eyeglasses, sometimes physiotherapy, sometimes uh, some kind of training, let's say yoga or whatever, you know, those types of things. Uh, but I don't, they don't really come into the picture firsthand. I don't make any sort of diagnosis on that. I'm curious though, so, um, I mean, there are many approaches and they're all valuable, they're all okay with me. I mean, I, I don't mind, it's just that, um, you have to have uh, some knowledge of the things that you are doing, and uh, so I concentrate on what I have knowledge of. There is a super question that is so interesting. So, how do you consider those cases where there is a variability in results between different repeat exams? How many tests do you do normally? And if there are differences, which one you consider as a reference? That's a one million dollar question. Okay, so there's um, we have spoken. If you remember, I, I had uh, before using the Tethan, I, I was using another electromyograph, and um, I was using specific software that was developed uh, a long time ago by Professor Ferrario. 
and uh, it, it did allow me to work out the mean between various exams. So I was working on the mean rather than on the specific exam. Because yes, there is variability. And um, it's not so important to concentrate on the single numbers. It's more important to concentrate on the general idea. If there's a big variability, then probably there's something that is not stable or stabilized yet. So you have to be patient and repeat the exam, maybe in some other day, because um, you, we don't, we cannot rush biology. So please keep in mind that we have the patient in front of us. And the patient has had a, a, a day at the office or a day with the, with the kids. And uh, maybe you're at the end of the day. And mm, so there are a, a number of factors that can uh, in somehow, some ways um, change the results of the exam. So if you don't have the same um, results uh, time after time, something probably is not going in the right direction. So the best is to uh, repeat it in some other time, in some other date. And, but I have to be honest with you, I, I was used, I used um, to do the means and to repeat the exam at least three times to, to get a mean, an average. And, but I have seen that if you repeat it now, uh, I get I get very very similar results usually so uh, it's not such a big big problem so the, the most important thing is the calibration the calibration has to be reliable so if you have uh, very wildly uh, off uh, calibration that can uh, really uh, change the whole since everything is normalized to the calibration if you if the uh, calibration is not reliable then you're in trouble so the best thing is to start with a reliable calibration repeat it enough times so and check that it's it's uh, uh, really giving the same result and then everything else follows really and like I said, it can be that you just uh, picked the wrong day for the patient. So we'll probably in the next release, we will insert these options. So for choosing the mean values between calibration and trials. So we will be back to be more precise from a certain point of view. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. For this, in this moment, I saw that a doctor raise up the hand but is not right typing any questions so uh if you don't have any other question i uh, i will quit the the webinar so thank you again dr smith it was a really really okay. big pleasure for us having you as a as a speaker and it was super interesting your 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 webinar thank you thank you very much okay so thank you again, and uh, that's it. Here's our, there's, here's uh, his contact, so on Facebook and Twitter, and also the emails. If you want to discuss also with Dr. Schmitz, uh, you can do it, and uh, have a nice evening.